Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic today, Tim. I cannot wait for people to hear our fine guest that we have on today. Always great to have this gentleman back and giving us updates on a cause that's very important to us and very important to the listeners. But Tim, the other cause that's important to me is how you are. So how are you doing, sir? <laughs> I am doing all right. Thanks a lot for asking. Yeah, I'm excited to introduce this conversation we had with former police chief Lou Barry, and he is a current private investigator, and he's newly on the board of Private Investigations for the Missing, along with us, Lance. And Private Investigations for the Missing is a nonprofit organization that provides investigative services for loved ones of missing people. You can learn more about everything that they and we do at investigationsforthemissing.org. And we have these monthly board meetings where Lou will join. And when he was asked to formally join the board, I was a little surprised because I was like, he's always here. I thought he was on the board because he was just, he's such a staple in this uh, nonprofit that it was. It was hard to imagine that he was ever not on the board. So we really welcomed him officially. And the information that he brings during these board meetings is primarily case updates and the case updates that come to PIs for the missing that have been resolved. And we never really talk about them on air. We don't have a case that we get into, a missing person story that we talk about for 45 minutes to an hour, and then a follow up and it's and it's solved, you know, like, quote, solved. We can't do that. There are so many of them that have had a resolution. And we just wanted to get Lou on to speak in the most general terms possible without giving up any privacy or affecting any investigation. These updates on on the number of cases that have come to PIs for the Missing's table and, and have had some form of resolution. Yeah, so we speak about the ones that have been resolved, and as you say, um, yeah, we speak in generalities about those because those are ones that really didn't go to the media. They were, they were cases, missing persons cases that were resolved before we ever did a podcast about them. That is one of the things we want to uh, discuss here in this conversation with Lou, but there's other cases that are being submitted to PIs for the missing that haven't been resolved. And that is still one of the focuses of PIs for the Missing. So if anyone in your family is missing and you would like these services, please fill out the form at investigationsforthemissing.org. And also, if you'd like to donate to PIs for the Missing, and we're always accepting donations. Honestly, we always need donations as well. If you'd like to donate, you can do so through the site. Again, it's investigationsforthemissing.org. And Investigations for the Missing is an official 501c3 nonprofit, so they are a tax write-off for any donations that you do give. And these funds go to the expenses that licensed private investigators submit after they have looked into a missing person. So that is where your money will be going. Right, and we talk a little bit about that in the conversation here with Lou. So this is really a great, um, informative conversation if you're thinking about submitting your loved one to this organization. And another way to give, Tim, as you know, and as our listeners are finding out, registration is open for the first, hopefully annual, 5K Run for the Missing. This will be taking place on Sunday, September 8th, and the registration fee goes towards private investigations for the missing. And as you heard, all of that funding goes towards the licensed PIs as they look for these missing individuals. So this is a 5K Sunday, October 8th, starts at 11 a.m., and you can go to piftm.org slash run or you can go to Run Sign Up and search Run for the Missing to register. This takes place in Reading, Massachusetts, which is just a suburb of Boston, so very easy to get to. Again, all of the registration fees go towards PIs for the Missing. There'll also be t-shirt giveaways. There'll be other giveaways, raffle items. So check that out, piftm.org slash run. Okay, everybody. So we'll see you at the 5K in October of this year. And we're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be right back with private investigator Lou Barry. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast, Lou Barry. How are you today? I'm doing great. How about yourselves? We're doing 
amazing. We just had an incredible moment right there where in real time you received a call that had a connection to private investigations for the missing, a call that you'd been waiting on for a couple of weeks, you said. But I love these episodes where we have you on periodically because we're going over uh, these cases that come into private investigations for the missing and, and we're providing uh, the, that glimpse behind the curtain that I think a lot of people need and... We, we do, as an organization, have a lot of success here. We just don't talk too much about it because it's the work that goes into it, right? You know, it's the work that goes into it, and and we need to, I guess, list all of these out and go at them in, in a big bulk as opposed to one at a time. And you don't want to rest on your laurels either. Well, some of it's private information, too. So um, in this conversation here, I think we're going to be speaking a little bit in generalities um, instead of um, in specifics with uh, certain cases. But um, Lou Barry, you are a private investigator. And uh, can you um, just refresh our listeners' memories a bit on your background? Sure. I, um, I spent about 35 years in law enforcement, started off on Cape Cod, I spent 11 years down there as a, a patrol officer, and then I was detective for a number of years. Then I was a, a sergeant and then became a police chief up in the western part of the state where, where I was chief for 24 years. I retired. I'd been affiliated with local colleges as an adjunct instructor for over 30 years and was twice uh, asked to be interim public safety director at one of the local colleges while they were in the process of hiring a new public safety director. But then I got into some private investigating and uh, started off doing sexual assault cases against children for civil suits after Massachusetts uh, changed the statute of limitations and allowed civil suits for up to when the victim turns age 53, which is a major change from what it used to be. So I did a few of those and then there was some slack time and I I got involved in uh, one of the more infamous, I guess, cases in, in New England and that's Brianna Maitland's case. Bruce, our founder's daughter, who went missing up in Northern Vermont in 04. So I met with Bruce and and asked him if he would like some help, you know, on the case, maybe a fresh set of eyes. Um, So I've been working on that case now since I think about 2016, maybe. Um, Met Greg Overacker. Greg and I worked together closely on that and other cases now. So when Bruce started the nonprofit, it was an easy transition, I guess, to go from working on his daughter's case, which is not affiliated with the nonprofit that's totally funded out of, uh, by family, not by bro, uh, by the nonprofit, uh, into the nonprofit where I had been helping them out since the beginning, which was, I think, 2017 or 18, I think we incorporated. It's great that you mentioned that because we always forget to clarify that this nonprofit was not founded specifically for Brianna Maitland's disappearance. This was inspired by his daughter. He wanted to use this to help other families and immediately recognized this would be a conflict of interest if any funds were going towards his own personal experience and any investigation. So right from the jump, like that was one of the first things that he said when this nonprofit was being organized was that he wants to be clear that this isn't specifically to put any resources into finding his daughter, which I think is super admirable. And I remember when he first said that, like almost getting... I don't want to say like choked up, but I just realized how much emotion had to go into that to make that decision for him to say this, this is now about other people and not about me. Correct. And that, and that's why he started, as you said, he, the nonprofit, he recognizes or recognized that families cannot afford to hire private investigators. It's just financially out of reach out of the vast majority of the population. And he also recognized the fact that many of these so-called cold cases or unresolved cases fall on the wayside because the law enforcement agencies don't have the resources. They're barely able to keep up with current cases, let alone concentrate a lot of effort and manpower into historic cases. Um, so as a result, these files just get pushed further and further back on the shelf and, and no one looks at them from a law enforcement perspective. So he recognized uh, part, a great deal on um, due to Greg Overacker, um, who actually suggested this idea to him many years ago, that, you know, he recognized the value of having someone who's, who's still working actively on that case specifically for that family. 
Can you tell us what your role is in the nonprofit Private Investigations for the Missing? Sure. Basically, what I do for the most part, I, I, I guess I act in a couple roles. One is as an investigator. A few of the cases I investigate myself actively investigate. I guess maybe the best time, the best way to explain what I do is to explain what our process is on how cases come to us. And, and basically what happens is people make a request, a family member or, or someone makes a request uh, in one of uh, several ways. They, they can go on our website and send, fill out a form and it goes to our executive director who will then um, forward it to me to be evaluated or it comes in on our tip line. We've been getting more and more uh, recorded calls from people requesting assistance, which was not the purpose of the tip line initially, but seems to be an effective way for people to request our services. Um, and third is via our email, which is um, piftmtips at gmail.com. We're getting a number of requests in that way. So the tip line and phone call requests and ultimately the website form requests come to my desk. And at that point, I contact whoever contacted us. Uh, I reach out to them, get some basic information on the case. No, two cases are the same, obviously. Everything is a little bit different. But normally what what I'll then do is reach out to whatever law enforcement agency has responsibility for investigating the case to find out, is it being investigated? Was it investigated? Is there a report available? Uh, if so, can we get a copy of it? And, you know, sometimes this is quick and easy. Sometimes uh, departments won't answer a phone call. Sometimes they're extremely responsive. Sometimes, as in the call that I just took, it's been waiting for their legal department in this particular department to have a non-disclosure agreement formulated and, and sent out. So, and that's been maybe three or four weeks. So, uh, there's no set timetable to these things. Some are fast, some are not so fast. So, I... I look at the case then and make sure that um, it fits our criteria. And we have to to kind of narrow the scope of the types of investigations that we do uh, simply because of the sheer volume of of requests that come in and of the cases that are out there. The, The goal of the organization was cold cases or unresolved cases historically. And in you know, the question comes up sometimes, well, when when does a case become a cold case? And there's obviously no set time period involved, but we don't usually take as on a case as one, one that is what I call fresh or recent. Sometimes we'll get a request that, you know, my son's been missing for a week. Well, that's not what we're out there for. Um, uh, even though a private investigator may or may not be helpful, we, we just don't have the resources to take on that kind of case. Part of the reason being sometimes it takes us several weeks to find an investigator <laughs> that will work w- with us on a case like that. So, and I've found is that in general, within two weeks, many times, these fresh cases are resolved one way or the other. Not always, obviously, but many times they are. So, we've had some that while we're in the process of reviewing, boom, the person shows up either safe and sound or deceased uh, before we even really make a decision as to whether we're not going to get involved in it. So part of the criteria we're using more and more now is how fresh is this case? Um, Secondly, um, we do not do custodial cases where it's a matter of, you know, dad has the kids and won't return them or mom has the kids and won't return them or whatever. We, We don't, we don't get involved in that. We don't get involved in, what is obviously an active homicide that case where we're not equipped for that. That's a law enforcement job. That's not a job for us. Now we've even narrowed it a little bit further so that we want, we want the families invested in this. So we really want the families to make the request a family member. If there is one, sometimes there's cases where there is no family to make a request. And secondly, we want to make sure that individual has, in fact, been reported missing to the police because we're running into more and more cases that are um, not really missing persons. They're, I can't find my boyfriend 
and you know I, I want to know where he is or you know or whatever. I mean, this is a silly example, but it's not a missing person case. It's not you know the person isn't missing. It's that they just haven't had any contact with them. So the, that's kind of the criteria we use. Based on that criteria, I'll make a recommendation to, to Bruce usually, and, and he makes a decision, yes or no. Or, you know, sometimes it doesn't even have to go that far. I can just say myself, we're, we're, we're not going to take this because it doesn't fit our criteria or whatever. Even aside from that, there are times when even though the case does not fit our criteria, exactly. We can maybe sometimes help out a little bit. There are times when hiring a private investigator just doesn't make any sense. Example, we had a request for a missing person in 1987 out of California. No one involved in the case is in California anymore. So in that case, a lot of times what I will do is database research for them. And the nice thing about that is it doesn't cost as much because I, I don't charge for my time and the only expense is through the database. We've been fortunate that we've been given access now to a very good database. Um, and as of right now, it's not costing us any money. So it's very inexpensive thing that we can do to help out people. And we've had some real good success with that. We've had about a dozen cases that have been found. The people have been found without hiring a PI just by utilizing access to database. We had a case not too long ago, a young man, he had some mental health issues. Dad wanted us to hire a private investigator. He'd only been missing two weeks. However, I found him at a hotel two towns away and he, he just did, he wanted to be there. He, it was a voluntary, I want to be here type thing. So that was the end of the case. Um, we had a case out in Texas where a son, a mother was looking for her son and again, I located him. It was a voluntary thing. He didn't want to have any contact with her. Okay. So that was the end of that. Um, one of the real happy ones, I think, was um, just not too long ago, maybe a month and a half ago, uh, a man contacted us trying to find his sister. And she he had not heard from her since 1990. None, no one in the family had any idea where she was. And I located her in the Bronx and gave him her contact information. And the family on 4th of July <laughs> had a family reunion. And it was, you know, a real, just a real happy ending. And that, that's what you like to see, you know? Wow. So, yeah, it was that was really, really good. We've had a couple that, um, again, uh, we had a woman who voluntarily disappeared, changed her name. We found her, but she was happy under her in her new life so that was the end of that and you know we have cases like that it's on and on we we had a, our first locate was a runaway you may recall this it was brought to our attention by vanessa whalen and we it was a young man who ran away i think he was 16 out of baltimore or somewhere and uh we located him in um living on his own in an apartment he's in his 20s now no one ever looked for him <laughs> He just ran away and started a new life, and um, he's fine. Researchers located one in um, Washington, not as happy. Uh, she had disappeared in 2018, and uh, one of our researchers helping out on the case determined where she was, and she uh, unfortunately was found to be living in a garden shed. She had a, a, a substance abuse issue, but again, she'd been missing for four years. And the daughter uh, who had contacted us initially was going to try and recontact her and try and um, see if she could get her some help and, and get her back in the film. But at least she knew where she was and knew that she was alive and, and she had that opportunity. So those are some of the success stories, which are kind of boring as opposed to some of these missing person cases that are in the media. But well, I think it's it's a, a pr kind of a problem if these cases were to make it to the media, right? Because um, some of these people want uh, want their privacy and need their privacy. Just want to double back here. You said about fifteen cases where someone submitted to the nonprofit and that person was located. Yeah, somewhere around there, twelve to fifteen, I think. Yeah. Wow, that's that is impressive, and and yeah, again, this is these are the ones we can't really talk about. You know, that's right. Yeah, you know, that's not publicized because the reason they went missing in the first place is they don't want any attention. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of times we'll find them and 
they just don't they're happy doing where they are doing what they're doing and they don't want the family or whoever it was looking for them to, to interfere with that. So we never ever contact the individual who's doing the locate, who's asking us to locate the person and tell them where they are without talking to the person who's been located to make sure that they want that. You know, we'll tell them, look, we've located them and they're okay, but we can't give you any more information. And most people respect that. Yeah. I think that that was, uh, that was definitely what was going through my head when you were talking about that. I think a lot of listeners were thinking that too. I think a lot of listeners were thinking, well, what's the communication between the people who are looking for the individual and the individual who voluntarily went missing? How do you, how do you manage that relationship? And you pretty much said it right there. If the person doesn't want to be located or, or associated, like at that point, the work of the nonprofit has to be done. That's like a family thing now. You know, that's something for them to work out. Uh, just knowing that the person's alive and safe is really where the nonprofit buttons up that case. Is that correct? Exactly. And, you know, there, there are other times. We, we had a case came in about a year ago. A man, he wasn't a family member. He was a friend, and he wanted us to find this other f- friend. And, you know, he said he had these issues, which are irrelevant. But I... Again, did a database search, could not locate him, um, didn't have enough information or no justification to hire some a PI. So he contacted us again not too long ago. And this time I ran him again through a, through a new database and I found a relative. And I contacted this individual and I left a message for the relative, which I've never heard back from. But uh, he got very, he, he got a little upset. Well, I didn't want the, the family doesn't want... Uh, them to know that he's missing, you know, it's all kind of a weird situation. So it's like, you know, we're out of here. That's not what we're here for. That's not our, our function. So we, we immediately got out of the case. We also don't do um, cases that are more of a search and recovery than a private investigation case. In case of point, Brandon Lawson, who, um, as you know, um, Jason Watts did a fantastic job in, organizing friends and doing a search and and we did or I did help him out a little bit with some advice on that and contacting law enforcement but that's not a case for a private investigator that's a case for a search team Um, and and we don't we don't do that we'll offer assistance as far as references and um, you know uh, referrals I should say not references um, to other agencies that do do that but you know, we're, we're not in the search and rescue occupation or, or whatever you, you want to call it. Um, so we so we get some of those too where we have to see basically, look, this isn't a job for a private investigator. You need a search team, not a, not a private investigator. You know? Yeah, I do think that that's also important to clarify as well because I think a lot of people do hear private investigations and they feel like this is in line with actually recovering but that just shows the i guess the nuances of how an entire investigation would work that there has to be one step which is let's try to figure out the location and then that has to be passed off to another organization that has a specialty to do that and you know we could start a nonprofit that says search and rescue for the missing but that's not the private investigation part and I think it's important for people to know that. So, And the other thing is some of these cases, as I said, we don't do active homicide investigations. We'll get, we've gotten to the point on several cases where we know the person is deceased and we have a good idea of who did that. We don't know necessarily where the, the body is, but it's no longer a private investigation case. It's a law enforcement case. And at that point, you know, we're not in the business of arresting people or prosecuting people or investigating homicides. We've got to, at that point, step back and say, okay, law enforcement, here you go. You know, if we can give you any information or offer whatever assistance we can, then we will. But that's not our job, nor should it be. You know, that's the police job. Sometimes the police departments are extremely cooperative, and other times they don't want to hear about it. Um, they've written an off as a missing person, and that's the end of that. So um, it's unfortunate. But And what's the difference there? And, and maybe this is just a case-by-case thing, but why would one law enforcement agency be um, helpful 
and one not reply or not be interested in in the case much uh, at all? I don't think there's a particular reason. Uh, I think it depends on a case by case basis. Some departments, I get the impression, would rather not have a case solved than have an outside agency, be it us or another law enforcement agency, solve it. Sometimes it's a lack of resources where they may be swamped with active cases and they just don't have time to be dealing with cases, unfortunately, like this. Sometimes they don't know what to do. I I actually had an officer from a department within a month asked me, when I asked them about the case, I said, are they in NamUs? He said, what's that? Now, yeah, okay. So there's a variety of reasons. Um, I I found some um, agencies, particularly where it's a political agency, by that I mean maybe it's an elected official that runs the department and they, they get elected and they bring their buddies on board and there's just not a lot of, professional expertise there and they just are there for the sake of being there and that's they don't really accomplish a heck of a lot you don't become an investigator overnight you know you don't become an investigator by being with an agency and getting experience and working hard and you know that's what makes a good investigator and just some agencies just don't don't have that and i i hate to be critical and i but it's it's correct now other agencies totally the opposite they're Totally very professional, do a great job. You know, I, I don't know, the Samantha Tapp case, I'm sure you're, you you recall that one. And, and they um, talked to them. This is Burleson, Texas. And they basically were very honest. They said, look, we don't have time or resources to be investigating a case from 2004. But we can't share the records with you because at the time she was a juvenile. And that's protected under Texas law. However, they figured out a way. They hired me as a consultant. And now I was able to get all the police records and everything else. So this is an example of an agency that um, wants to do something, can't do something because of the volume that they have, yet figured out a way to get some help. So every agency is different. Uh, you know, I wish there were all like, like that and like some of the other departments we've worked with that are very, very cooperative and we'll send police reports and you know some you call them up and like yeah sure here what's your email address boom and you've got everything you know and we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors thanks to our sponsors and now we're back to the program and I, I really hope that like, word gets back to the agencies that don't behave like that because I feel like it's not like they don't want to help they're probably just stuck in this like mindset of like what can i do if the circumstances don't allow me to do something but you just cited an example where some people might have stopped and said well because of these laws i can't do anything because of these regulations i can't do anything oh wait but there's a solution i can hire this guy for whatever you know it doesn't matter if he's a consultant so it's his own fee that he's coming up with probably isn't very expensive and now we can do it so i think a lot of the agencies might not even realize like that could be an option so hopefully they're listening and and take that into account because what do you think it is like as far as workload for them to hire somebody like you is it just like an an accounting thing at that point i'm a hired consultant i i haven't seen any money from them nor do i expect any um i'm not here you know to get paid by them we're here to investigate the case for the nonprofit. So it's not a monetary thing. Although, again, we talk about funny agencies. I talked to one sheriff's department and explained what we did. And he said, okay, how much would you guys charge? And I said, well, charge. we don't charge. I said, we don't charge the clients. We certainly aren't going to charge your agency. But that's, you know, sometimes the what you run into out there. They don't have any concept of it. Now, one, one thing I, I try to stress to the agencies is that um, we, I say we, I, because I'm the one who finds the, the private investigators to work the cases. I'm pretty picky about 
who we hire. I mean, we just don't go in the yellow pages and say, I'll hire this guy. I, I checked them out pretty good. The vast majority are hired, or excuse me, are former law enforcement or FBI agents or state police or, you know, some type of, have some type of law enforcement background. Uh, we've got, you know, one of our better ones, a retired New York City homicide detective. We've got the retired uh, a sergeant from New York who ran the Missing Persons Bureau up there for a while. Um, we've got California police officers that are retired detectives. Um, we've got an FBI, ex-FBI agent working a case down south. We've got a former Atlanta homicide detective working in a couple cases. So, you know, we don't just go willy-nilly and pick investigators. We hire people that are good and that will, that understand, you know, the need to get along and work with law enforcement. And uh, so we try to stress that with the agencies involved, that if we assign an investigator, they're going to be professional. Um, and we run into some stumbling blocks finding investigators. I, I had a case down in Mississippi and I had a heck of a time finding someone that was willing to work with for a four hour rate that was, was good. And we finally found one and <laughs> something I never knew. There's a big ballet festival in Jackson, Mississippi of all places that runs the month of June. And he was tied up doing security on that. And, but now was finally working the case. But <laughs> so it seems like an odd place for a ballet festival. It's an international competition. It's not just local. You mentioned um, databases earlier and, uh, and I'm just curious if there's any, any additional information or insight in what databases those are or, uh, or what they do? The databases that we use, and I have like four of them, I think, that I am involved in uh, with or you utilize. They basically gather public information from all over the country, all sorts of different sources, and they compile that. For instance, if I put in, you know, Tim Polari and I had enough information you're from Massachusetts. I know that. I could probably find you pretty easily. And I'm going to get your date of birth, your social security number, former addresses, current address, uh, email addresses, associates, uh, relatives. Um, depending upon the database that you use, some focus on different things. One of them does social media. That's what it's really good at. One of them runs plates and registration information nationwide. One of them um, just compiles general data, but they have a nice feature where they can uh, search license plates that are scanned by companies that go around scanning license plates looking for repossessions. So in other words, if your car is parked at a parking lot, tow truck comes through, they're scanning all the license plates, they find out that your car has a repo on it and your car is gone when you come out. All these license plates that they've scanned they sell to these companies who then compile it. So if I run the plate, it would show, yeah, well, this car showed up here, 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 and here. You know, So that's a valuable tool. They all have their, their good parts and their bad parts. That's why I subscribe to three or four of them because, the, you know, depending on what you're looking for, that's the database you go to. I want to take it back uh, real far to the beginning of this episode where you said uh, that you – only take on missing persons through family members. And I mean, I know the answer to this, but can you give us the reason why you only take on this organization only takes on missing persons through with family members? I guess p partially that's because that's what Bruce was most uh, focused on. And that avoids a lot of this, um, my ex-boyfriend, I want to find my ex-girlfriend, I want to find out where she is, or I want to know where my ex-wife is and you know who she's with now, and that type of a case. Um, you know, those people aren't really missing. And I think that the thought process is, if it's a missing person, who's most concerned about it? Well, it's family. Now, there are times when there is no family, uh, and that case will... will you know, consider taking the case anyways, depending on the circumstances. I had a, a case come in last night and I, I know we're going to screen it out, but it was a woman who was looking for a college classmate. Unusual circumstances. The girl was actually uh, fled Cuba in the 60s when Fidel Castro first 
came to power and was taken away, um, not taken away, but sent away by her family to a Florida um, through a program called Pedro Pan and subsequently went to a foster home and then went to a college with this woman and she hasn't heard from her and she wondered what happened to her. So she has no, this girl has no family, this missing person has no family in the United States. Any relatives she might have still are in Cuba. We're probably not going to take the case just because it looks like a voluntary disappearance, not a missing person. But I did, again, do some database searching for her and have been able to locate her. I've got to notify her of that later on today. But it, that's why I think Bruce wanted to kind of keep it to the family, keep it to family issues when at all possible. You know, we've had a couple instances where the family hasn't been on board and it's become a problem. Our first case, Erica Franowick. Greg did a heck of a job on that case, and we can't get law enforcement interested, and now the family's kind of lost interest. So, And we went to them. They didn't come to us. So the process normally what happens is when a case is requested and we decide, yeah, okay, we, we can look into this, we have the family sign an MOU, basically explaining what we do, what we can't do, what we won't do, what we will do, and that we don't guarantee anything. And then, we, again, we try and get a police report, and then we look – for a, 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 a vetted private investigator. And um, at that point, they're assigned, they sign an agreement relative to terms and conditions and all that, and um, the case becomes active. So right now we have 13 cases that are actively being investigated by private investigators. Um, some of them have gone on now over a year. You know, I can't talk about it, but we've got, I'd say, one close as cases extremely close to being resolved and two others that are well on their way to being resolved. And both of them, all three of them are historic, but we've been at it for, like I said, at least a year in all three cases. Families cannot afford to keep a private investigator working that long. It just gets to be extremely, extremely expensive. Uh, we've also got two cases that are right now um, we've agreed to accept, but we're waiting before we go and find a PI. I want to see the reports to determine, number one, do we really need a PI or can we can we do this remotely? And secondly, I want to see the police reports to find out, OK, which PI would be best, where we where location wise, skill wise, you know, what do we need? to do in this case because it sometimes makes a difference so that's uh that's pretty much where we uh where we stand right now we've got a couple cases that are I, again um we're trying to help the people via database they're not really the classic missing person case one of them involves a guy who's trying to find his mother who walked out on them 45 years ago we're not going to hire a pi for that because we have no idea where to start but through database and through the help of another one of our investigators, we've found we're getting making progress on finding out where she is, what what happened to her. Another one whose brother moved to Texas, changed his name, and we tracked him up to about 2008, and now we've lost him. So, again, we're not going to hire a PI, but we if we can help him through the databases, we will. We've got a couple cases that you know we're waiting for return calls. One of them. The only one who knows anything about the case is the chief, and he's on vacation for a week. So we got to wait for him to come back. You know, that's sometimes what happens in small departments. We've had well over 180 requests come in that, since we've been tracking them. Just to show you what's happened, since January, we're over 90 cases just since January. So half the cases we've screened have come in in the last seven months. Wow. So safe to say that private investigations for the missing is growing and gaining steam. It is. I'd say a highest percentage of our cases are screened out, um, unfortunately, because they are a matter of either a voluntary disappearance, you can tell immediately, or it's a very fresh case. Sadly, most of them, the people missing have mental health issues or substance abuse issues or both. And it's very difficult Many of them, the caller will say, look, uh, my, you know, my son or my daughter is, you know, has whatever type of condition and they were in and committed into a hospital and I don't know what's happened to them. And I, and 
the, the hospital won't release any information because of HIPAA. It's a dead end for us because, you know, they won't release it to the family. They're certainly not going to release the information to us. So if we can't find them via searching the database, which most of the time we cannot because they're fresh, so they haven't developed this public information trail, so to speak, by, you know, renting a place or having mail delivery or, you know. So that takes time for that all to be populated in the databases. So we basically have to say, sorry, we just can't help you. Um, but we'll usually tell them six months, eight months, a year goes by, you still need help, call us back and we'll look at it again. Um, and that's a very difficult aspect of this job is to tell this crying mother on the phone that I'm sorry, I can't help you. You know, We can't help you. It's, it's very hard sometimes. And I, I hate to see people taken advantage of because some of them will go out and just hire someone who pays the case lip service and sends them a bill and doesn't do anything. Unfortunately, there's, there's people that hire investigators have to be careful who they hire because there's a lot of them out there that are not very professional. I hate to say this of any occupation, but we run into it over and over and over again. We had a, we had a case where, on a seven-year-old missing person case, they sent him a bill for doing surveillance. What are you surveilling seven years later? I mean, it, it doesn't even make any sense. You know, it's really unfortunate. We've we've talked about that and had people on to talk about you know just like the 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 gross element that that is. It's it's such an easy dip into a money grab for people who know that there's probably not going to be a solution if there hasn't been a solution for 12 years or 15 years, 20 and beyond. So yeah, go in there for a couple of months, a few months and get a quick couple thousand dollars and say, well, I've been surveying, you know, surveillance here. And like you said, like, what do you, what, what, what do you, what's where, what are you looking at that hasn't been looked at for a decade? And why, why does it cost $1,200? So yeah, people get taken advantage of all the time and, Especially in this, when there's just no clear answer and you're able to provide no clear answer and then charge it, you know, charge them for it. People are very vulnerable at that yeah. point. Their child is missing or their, you know, whatever loved one is missing and money is not important to them at that point. Oh, it's $1,500. I And they know that and they take advantage of that. And it's it's sad. It really is sad. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. You had said earlier that somehow along the lines, the tip line, which people can call uh, 1-866-331-6660, the tip line became a line where people were submitting tips as well as submitting missing persons. So they're, they're submitting cases as well through that tip line. Is it okay to say people can also submit if they know how to raise money for a nonprofit? Maybe they know how to fundraise on a larger scale or they're experienced in grant writing, et cetera. Can they also submit uh, their information through that tip line or through the email address? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you <don't>. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was set up as a tip line. It's turned into more of a request for assistance line, but I would love to have it have some, hey, how can I help <laughs> requests come in too? I mean, that would be just fantastic, um, you know, because we, we run on donations and it's very, as I said before, these cases can get extremely expensive. We need funding. We need donations. We need, we'd love to have a corporate sponsor or a you know, some type of a permanent funding source um, that, you know, where, where we can maybe pick up a few more cases than we normally would because we have the funds to do that. Um, and, you know, I don't want to, I, I can't say enough about the quality and the generosity of our investigators because almost without exception, they put in countless hours that they don't charge us for. Some of them, I've never seen a bill from them, nor do they want any money. They're doing it because they they want to do it. They want to give back. In order to sustain that, um, that, that's an important part of the type of investigators that I look for when we're looking to hire one is 
I don't want to hire a big firm because they're they're in the business to make money and they've got a lot of people working for them and overhead and expenses. You know, I look for guys like me. They're retired. They have a pension. They have time on their hands. They, they, they've had some type of training, experience, expertise, call it what you will, and they want to kind of give back. And we've been fortunate to get some very, very good people that are willing to do that and work at it. What I consider a good rate, but less than what many of them would normally get paid uh, to do what they do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Lou, this has been a great conversation about private investigations for the missing. Is there anything else that you'd like to hit on here? Not that I can think of. I, you know, I, I just appreciate. Uh, again, our investigators, I appreciate the work that you guys do. You know, the people in the media that uh, support us and that will, are willing to get our cases out there. Um, I wish we could share more details about every case, but it's just not a real good investigative practice necessarily to do that always. Um, and I know many of our investigators don't want notoriety. They don't want publicity they just they just want to do their job and and help out and that's it but i i i do appreciate the work that they do um and the time that's involved uh, i know it's you know it can be extremely time consuming for everybody and you know that the nice thing is we've developed here as we've grown as an organization we have partnered with um magnet forensics as you know who does digital investigative software or examination. And um, they've loaned us an expert and they're free of charge. And we can, we now offer that as part of an investigative tool. We've got a, an association that I'm working to solidify on now with one of the data companies. It's very good that is giving us free access to their database, which is you know, a real cost savings to us because we have to pay by the search usually. You know, we've developed a lot of contacts with people with um, human remains dogs because unfortunately that's sometimes part of our cases. And and we now have made contacts with one um, in Georgia uh, who's very, very uh, well credentialed. We have one up in Maine. We have association we're trying to build upon out in California. Um, we just had a one from Connecticut do a search for us on a case that I can't discuss, but um, voluntarily, these are all volunteers. They charge, if anything, gas um, to get to where they have to search, and that's it. So we, as time has gone by, we've developed a lot of relationships with other groups or organizations that are willing to, to help us uh, in the cause. So that's also very gratifying to see that other people do appreciate the efforts of the organization. As an aside, I sent an email out last week and I've never, I've been a lot involved in a lot of organizations and groups and committees and et cetera, et cetera, in my career. And I've never had the pleasure of working with one with the expertise of the board of directors has here. They, you know, it's just a group of top-notch people that can iron out disagreements and <laughs> um, come up to a, a, a mutual agreeable conclusion, you know, as evidenced, as you know, by some issues that have come up recently. And, but the expertise involved is just rare, I think, that a group of people like that would come together, yourselves included. Well, thank you. From a variety of, of, of occupations. I mean, we have law enforcement, we have media, you know, there's different groups of people from different areas and bringing in different uh, areas of expertise. And it's, it's really pretty, pretty good to watch, really. And we're really excited to have you join the board officially recently, which is amazing that you're bringing all of your experience and expertise to the to the table as well. But um, I feel like I need to say this live here. Uh, Tim was the only holdout when we were voting on whether or not you should be on the board. Uh, we've been talking about it for months. I mean, again, he was steadfast in his position. I said, absolutely not. Just kidding, obviously. <laughs> I didn't reply all, but of course I gave an emphatic yes. Well, that's good. I'm not sure how that happened. Um, I, I know I told Bruce after the last meeting we had, I said, you know, I probably should have kept my mouth shut because I'm not on the board. <laughs> 
and I don't know whether that's what kind of put the thought in his head or not, but I've never really been one to not give an opinion if I have it, I guess so. Yeah. Good. No, that was the best board meeting I think we ever had, at least in my opinion. It was so great to just share. Everyone is sharing their opinions and ideas and inform thoughts on a really ethically difficult situation to navigate. Correct. And everyone coming maybe from different perspectives, yet not (laughs) necessarily coming from the perspective you would think or not having the point of view you would think they would have from their perspective let's put it that way you know they obviously look at both sides of the issue and they're not just focused on their point of view and and how it looks from where they sit you know which is again that's why one of the reasons i say that it's it's an extremely professional board and great to be a part of that 